how do you get to this from this? Hi, this is Dr. Ben Finio, and in this video, which is the first in a series, I will explain how to build a circuit on a breadboard based on a circuit diagram. This is a skill that I think a lot of us take for granted if we have enough experience with electronics, but it is something that I frequently hear from students that they wish it was taught a little more explicitly because they have some trouble making that leap. So if this looks too simple for you, again, this is the first video in a series. Future videos will cover more advanced topics like adding switches, transistors, operational amplifiers, and integrated circuits. So if you want to skip ahead to that more advanced content, you can go ahead and find those videos linked down in the description below this one. In this video, we're just going to cover the basics and use a very simple circuit as an example. So in case you're not sure what you're looking at here, over here on the right is a screenshot of a physical circuit on a breadboard built in an online circuit simulator called Tinkercad that we'll talk about later. A breadboard is a tool that allows you to easily and quickly prototype a circuit and move parts around without permanently soldering things. Over here on the left, we have a circuit diagram or schematic, which is a way to represent this circuit on the breadboard. Now, if you are just getting started in electronics and doing something like buying a starter Arduino kit, you might have instructions that include a breadboard diagram like this, and putting this together is kind of like just building Legos. It's nice color-coded instructions that tell you where to put the parts. However, as you get more advanced into electronics, or maybe take a college-level introductory electrical engineering class, start buying parts and looking at data sheets, you're usually just going to see the diagram over here like this on the left, and it is up to you to interpret that and figure out how to build the circuit on the breadboard. That's what we're going to cover in this video. So in order to understand this, you need to understand what the circuit diagram represents. Each symbol in the diagram represents a physical circuit part. There are many more of these symbols. We are just going to go over a few with this simple intro circuit. So this squiggly line represents a resistor, which is a part that provides electrical resistance and follows Ohm's law to resist electrical current. This series of parallel alternating short and long lines with the plus and minus sign represents a battery. Normally this will be labeled with a certain voltage in the circuit diagram. And this kind of triangle thing with a line on one end and these little lines coming out represents a light emitting diode. This big triangle represents that current can only flow through a diode in one direction. And these little arrows coming off kind of represent the light coming out of the light emitting diode or LED for short. Finally, these straight black lines just represent wires, which in a physical circuit can be different colors. And in real life, wires do have some resistance to them, but especially in small circuits built on a breadboard, these wires are usually so short that that resistance is negligible, and we treat them like they are effectively zero resistance, so we ignore their length. So if we forget about the breadboard for a minute, when we combine these symbols in a circuit and connect them with wires, that represents how these symbol the circuit parts are connected and how current flows in the physical circuit. So usually when you encounter common circuits in things like textbooks and data sheets, they are kind of drawn left to right with conventional current flowing in a clockwise manner. I say conventional current because the definition or convention for electrical current is that it flows from positive to negative. This usually confuses people who took physics and know that in metal conductors, the current flowing is actually moving electrons, which flow from negative to positive, the opposite direction. But again, you just kind of have to get used to in electrical engineering. The convention is that we define positive current as flowing from positive to negative. So you can trace the path current would flow in this circuit from the positive terminal of the battery through these wires, through the resistor, through the LED, and back to the negative terminal of the battery. Again, over here in the physical circuit, I have arranged it so the physical layout of this circuit is kind of the same as the layout of the circuit diagram. And again, you can trace that current. The positive terminal of the battery is connected to the resistor. Current goes through the resistor. That is then connected to the positive side of the LED, through the LED, out the negative side of the LED, and back to the negative terminal of the battery. So hopefully that makes sense when you see these side by side and the diagram is in the same physical arrangement as the actual circuit. I think what starts to trip people up is that the physical arrangement of the parts does not necessarily need to match and you can move things around without changing the electrical connections. So one very simple example is what if I just take this resistor and move it over here in the diagram. So you might think that, oh, that means I need to remove this resistor up here in the physical circuit. But note that the electrical connections and the path the current takes have not changed. 
So the current still flows from the positive end of the battery through the resistor, through the LED, and back to the negative end of the battery. And the case is the same over here. The current still takes the same path. And remember that we are assuming these wires are short enough that they effectively have zero resistance. So the fact that I physically moved this resistor up over here, and now this wire looks a little shorter and this wire looks a little longer, didn't change anything electrically. These are both still just zero resistance connections between the different components in the circuit. So you can see how I can continue to do that. For example, I could even mirror the entire circuit. So now it is flipped left to right. But again, the current still follows the same path out the positive terminal of the battery, through the resistor, through the LED, back to the negative terminal of the battery. So this diagram is still electrically equivalent to this physical circuit, even though this is conventionally not how you would usually see it drawn in a textbook. Again, normally the current would kind of go clockwise instead of counterclockwise. So you can continue to do that. For example, I could draw some long funky wire here and that doesn't mean I need a long loopy wire in the physical circuit. Again, trace the path of the current and ultimately you see that the positive terminal of the positive terminal of the battery is just connected to the resistor. So the shape and orientation of this wire, again, when we're dealing with small circuits on a breadboard and not worried about things like inductance or radio frequency or resistance of very long wires or any of that crazy stuff that you're not gonna get into in a beginner Arduino circuit, the physical layout doesn't really matter. So the same goes for the physical circuit. If we go back to our normal diagram here and our physical circuit that matches, I can make these wires all over the place and rotate the resistor, move the LED, but again, I have not changed the electrical connections in this circuit or the path that the current takes. It is still positive terminal of the battery to the resistor, through the resistor, to the LED, and then back through the LED. So you need to get away from the idea that the physical layout of the circuit needs to match the physical layout of the circuit diagram because that is really only possible when you have very simple circuits like this. When you start using a breadboard and you get more complex, more advanced circuits, the physical layout of the circuit on the breadboard is not going to match the diagram. So that's something you need to learn early on. So speaking of the breadboard, when you build a circuit, you're probably not going to use loose wires to connect components like this, you're going to build it on a breadboard, at least when you're in the prototyping stage, maybe when you're ready to build something more permanent, you might solder onto a protoboard. But you're probably going to build your circuits on a breadboard like this if it's temporary. So to do that, you need to understand how a breadboard works. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So we're going to switch gears a bit here and switch over to a circuit simulator that runs in a web browser called Tinkercad Circuits, and it lets you work in a breadboard view as opposed to a schematic view. So rather than filming a physical circuit, I'm going to record this on my screen because that makes it a little easier to show the circuit diagram and the breadboard side by side. So what I'm going to do is bring out a breadboard here, and the nice thing about Tinkercad is that it highlights which holes in the breadboard are connected. So a breadboard consists of a grid of holes. They're labeled A, B, C, D up through column J, and the rows here labeled one through 30. So for example, you can identify a hole. This is hole C5, kind of like the game Battleship. And you can see that each half row here is highlighted by these little green circles showing that the holes in this row are all electrically connected to each other. So for example, if I put a wire connecting say row five down to row 10, I have now connected all the holes here in row five are now connected by this wire to all the holes here in row 10. And if I add another wire, say bridging this gap here, again, current could, there's nothing else in the circuit, there's no battery or anything right now, but there is a path for current to flow through this wire and then it kind of goes underneath the surface of the breadboard. There's a little metal connector behind there. So you can just think of it as a wire that connects all these holes. So there is now a path for current to flow from this point through the breadboard, through that wire down here, through the breadboard here, through that wire, and then over all the way over here. So it is redundant to put a wire in a breadboard connecting holes in the same row. There's never really any need to do that because those holes are already connected. So you may have also wondered, what about these long strips on the side? So you can see these don't have the number or letter labels, but they have the plus and minus signs next to them. These are called buses or rails. You usually use these to deliver power to your circuit. 
In our case, we are going to be connecting an external battery. Sometimes if you're in an electronics lab, there might be a larger benchtop breadboard that plugs into the wall, and these are kind of powered internally, but what we're gonna be doing is connecting an external battery to these. So what we're gonna do next is pull up the circuit schematic side by side with the breadboard and show you how you would actually go through building the circuit on the breadboard from scratch if you only have the diagram to start. So here we go, we have our circuit diagram over on the left and we have a blank breadboard over on the right. And something I had omitted from the circuit diagrams I showed you earlier is there will usually be some text giving you additional information about the parts in the circuit. So just having the symbol for a battery doesn't tell you what voltage that battery is, or just having the symbol for the resistor doesn't tell you the size or the resistance of that resistor. So there will usually be some additional text telling you specifically what parts to use or part numbers for integrated circuits, that sort of thing. So here we have a circuit with a six volt battery a 220 ohm resistor and a red LED. So in Tinkercad, first I'm gonna add those parts to my circuit. Now it lets you, this is just a 1.5 volt battery, but it has a little drop down that lets me switch up to four batteries, which is gonna be six volts. And I'm gonna add a red LED and I'm going to add a resistor. And again, in real life, you'd be picking physical resistors from a kit, but Tinkercad lets you edit the value of that resistor. So I'm gonna change that to 220 ohms. And now my goal is to, okay, I wanna build this circuit on the breadboard. How do I know where to start or how do I go about doing that? So in general, when you're working with a single battery pack, the first thing you're going to want to do is make sure you have power connected to your breadboard. However, you wanna plan that out, but then maybe leave one wire of the battery pack disconnected until the very end, which can just help prevent short circuits so you don't accidentally blow things up if you put something in the wrong place. So. What I'm gonna do here is just general good practice for working with a breadboard to make sure you have power available everywhere. That's kind of the point of these buses is as you start to build a more complicated circuit, it gives you easy access to power and ground anywhere on the breadboard instead of say running wires from the battery pack directly to everywhere where you need it on the breadboard individually. You just run one wire from the battery pack to these buses and then you have that available everywhere you need it. So I'm gonna delete those. Now note that the buses on opposite sides of the breadboard are not connected. This bus over here on the right is not connected to this ground bus over here on the left. So I'm going to first add wires connecting the buses. So I have power and ground available on both sides of my breadboard. And again, this is good practice when you are working with just a single voltage. When you're working with something like operational amplifiers where there's positive and negative voltage supplies or an Arduino where there's a logic voltage and you might have an external battery pack providing motor voltage, you might be careful because you might wanna separate the positives in that case. But here, I just have a single battery pack. So I'm gonna connect the buses on both sides of the breadboard. And for now, I'm gonna connect the ground wire. But again, usually you wanna wait until the very end to turn the power on to your circuit to make sure you don't blow anything up. So I'm gonna leave that positive wire disconnected for now and save that at, for the end. So next, in a simple circuit like this, I kind of just need to pick a place to start. So I'm gonna choose my LED and I'm just gonna to need to pick a place to put that in the breadboard. Now, remember what I said about holes in the breadboard being connected across a row like this. So if I take my LED, which it's not letting me drag it for some reason, there we go and put it in the breadboard like that, I'm short circuiting the two legs of my LED together there. So I don't wanna do that. I wanna make sure the two sides of the LED called the anode, the positive side, and the cathode or the negative side are in different rows of the breadboard because if I look at my circuit diagram, they need to be connected to different things, right? I don't have both sides of the LED shorted together by a wire. They're connected to two different parts of the circuit. So in Tinkercad, I'm gonna go ahead and rotate that and that allows me to put the LED in two different rows of the breadboard. And again, for a very simple circuit like this where I'm not really worried about breadboard real estate, I can just pick a row. I, if I wanna stay at the top because I'm gonna expand this in the future, I can put it up here. If I wanna go in the middle or start a round number like row 10, it doesn't really matter. You kind of just need to pick a place to start building, at least when it's a simple circuit like this and you're not worried about real estate yet. So I've picked a place for the LED, just make the decision, put it in the breadboard, great. Now is when I need to start referencing my diagram and looking at what that LED is connected to. So the negative side of the LED, which again, I'm just kind of gonna pick that as a way to move forward, 
is connected over to the negative side of the battery. So I look at my breadboard, I remember that I'm using the buses so I don't have to go over to the negative side of the battery pack directly because that is what this big ground bus is for. And that allows me, again, the negative side of the LED is the cathode here, allows me to make a direct connection with a pretty short wire between the ground bus and this is the nice thing about the breadboard. I don't run a wire all the way over to the same hole the LED is in. I don't need to do that because all of these holes are connected as shown by the green highlighting there. So that lets me use a nice short jumper wire to connect the ground bus to the negative side of the LED. And remember, there's a path here because there's a metal connector in the breadboard that acts just like a wire and lets current flow from this point to this point. So, okay, I have just checked off one of the wires in my circuit diagram. I've made the connection from the negative side of the LED to the negative side of the battery. So what do we need next? We have our battery, we have our LED, we have not put a resistor in our circuit yet. So I'm going to bring out my resistor, and again in Tinkercad I'm going to go ahead and change that to 220 ohms. And again I need to pick a place to put this in the breadboard. Now this is where, you oh sorry I forgot I had already added one of those earlier, I'm going to delete that one and use this one instead. Here's where you want to start thinking about the physical layout and possibly keeping things a little compact and neat. So Again, you don't want to put the resistor with the leads in the same row because then they are going to be short circuited together. You got to make sure the leads of that resistor are in separate rows, but I know that this is going to be connected to my LED, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense for me to put it all the way down here, right? Again, I can do that for this simple circuit. There's not a lot of other stuff. My breadboard is going to be crowded, but it probably makes sense for me to keep that closer to my LED because if I look at my diagram, I know these two things are going to be connected. So I'm going to say I'm going to put my resistor here in rows 13 and 17, kind of close to the LED. And then I look at my diagram and I see my resistor has two connections. One is to the positive side or the anode of the LED, and one is over to the positive side of the battery. So I'm going to go ahead and use jumper wires to make both of those connections. I'm going to connect row 17 here over to my positive bus, which eventually is going to be connected to the positive side of the battery. I just haven't added that wire yet. And I haven't really talked about color coding. I've been glossing over this. Usually in electronics, we use red for positive and black for negative. So I'm going to go ahead and make that wire red since it's connected to that positive or power bus. And then I need a wire connecting the resistor to the LED. So sometimes people will get confused. Remember the breadboard, the holes are not connected vertically. So for example, even if I had put the resistor there, it looks like it's physically next to the LED, but these two rows are not connected. So I do need a jumper wire going up here from the resistor to the LED and say, I'm gonna make that a different color. I'm gonna make it green. So great, I now have a path where current can flow through this wire, through the breadboard there, through the LED, over one hole in the breadboard because they're connected in this row, through that wire, through the LED, back over here, and then to the ground bus. The one piece I am missing is my final connection to the battery. So you can see if I go ahead and hit start simulation here in Tinkercad, nothing happens, my LED lights up because I don't have a complete closed circuit yet. To do that, I'm gonna add my final wire. And again, you usually wanna wait until the last minute to finally connect power because if you do make a mistake, you don't wanna have a short circuit or blow something up. So you wanna double check your circuit and make sure everything is good before you turn power on. I'm gonna go ahead and add my final wire connecting positive power from the battery. I'm gonna make that one red and I'm gonna go ahead and hit start simulation and you see my LED will light up because I have built a complete path for current to flow on the breadboard. Out the positive wire, down the positive bus here, through that wire, through the resistor, through this wire, through the LED, and then back to the negative terminal of the battery pack. And again, you can see here, the physical layout of how this wound up on the breadboard is not really the same as the physical layout on the circuit. So here I have the battery pack over on the left, but the resistor is above the LED. Here the resistor wound up below the LED just because this LED kind of wound up flipped with the positive side down on the bottom. So the physical layout on the breadboard does not need to match the physical layout of the circuit diagram, but this is still electrically equivalent. So that's great, this works, it is electrically equivalent to my diagram, but you might have noticed that this isn't really as compact as I could have made it, which 
Again, for a very simple circuit like this where there's nothing else on your breadboard, doesn't really matter, but as you start to build more complex circuits, you kind of want to save space and keep things as organized as possible and really take advantage of how these breadboard holes are connected. So I actually have a couple unnecessary jumper wires here. For example, instead of using a jumper wire to connect the LED to the resistor like this, I can go ahead and delete that wire and move my resistor up so it is just directly connected to the LED in this breadboard row. Again, I don't really need an extra wire there at all because this breadboard row functions as a wire connecting those things. Now, since I have moved the resistor, I need to get rid of this wire and add another one connecting it to the power bus there. And you can see now I can run my simulation and I have another closed circuit and my LED will light up. I can even go one step further in this case and delete this wire. I'm actually gonna rotate my resistor 90 degrees. Now remember, both legs of the resistor can't be in the same row of the breadboard, but this row is not connected to the power bus. So I can actually place my resistor so one leg is over there in the power bus and one leg is over here in this row. Now I'm down to just one wire and I have this very nice compact part of the circuit on my breadboard where I have this resistor and the LED. So for example, if I was going to add a bunch more LEDs, which we're going to see in the next video, this would be a much neater way to do it where I now have plenty of space on my breadboard to go and add more, add more LEDs instead of spreading this out and kind of having this one part of the circuit take up a bunch of space. So there is no right or wrong way to do that. It can become a matter of personal preference or however you think having the circuit organized on the breadboard makes sense to you and makes it easy to keep track of what's going on and easy to debug. But again, the important part is that what you build is electrically equivalent to the diagram. Again, even if you physically rearrange and move things around on the breadboard, this does not have to match how it looks on the diagram as long as the parts that are connected, so terminal to terminal, for example, resistor to LED here, and the path that current takes is the same. So to quickly recap that process, start by making sure you are making good use of your power buses to make positive and ground easily accessible throughout the circuit. Then for a simple circuit like this, pick a part. I happen to pick the LED, but I could have started with the resistor instead. Pick a place for it in the breadboard, again, making sure that you're not short circuiting things by putting them in the same row and then look at the connections in your diagram and systematically make the connections to the other parts until you have a complete circuit, usually saving one wire of the battery for last as you do a last minute um, double check or debug of your circuit to make sure the diagram is correct so you don't short circuit anything, then connect the full power to the battery and your circuit should work. And again, in this video, we went through a pretty simple circuit with just three parts, which is fine if you're just getting started. If you do want to move on to more advanced circuits with multiple LEDs, things like buttons, switches, or parts that have multiple wires. So each part in this circuit only has two wires, but we have things like transistors and integrated circuits that can have three or more wires per part and building the circuit gets even more complicated. You can find additional videos in this playlist linked in the description below this one. Thank you.